Greetings and welcome to the Anhad virtual seminar on music and poetry. My name is Nasiruddin Shah. And I'm Ratna Pathak Shah. Porpoises are frolicking in the sea in Mumbai. Flamingos have descended in huge numbers in Belapur. There was a civet cat spotted in Calcutta. <laughs> Strolling on the street. And deer in Chandigarh. Mm -hmm. And I hear after many, many, many years, people are able to see the Himalayas from Jalandhar. It's fantastic. And it proves just one thing. The earth can get on perfectly without us human beings. And ironically, it is we who are who seem to be doing our best to destroy it and its inhabitants and loot its resources. That is the main concern of the poem which Ratna and I are going to recite for you. It's called The Elephant and the Chagopan and is one of the many wonderful poems in Vikram Seth's uh, Beastly Tales from Here and There, in which all the protagonists are animals. And the parallels are very obvious. They do not need to be explained. They're sometimes startling, sometimes inspiring, sometimes amusing, and sometimes downright frightening to ponder what would be if animals began to behave as humans do. Uh, any resemblance to people living or dead is purely intentional. The Elephant and the Tragopan. <clears throat> In Bingle Valley, broad and green, where neither hut nor field is seen, where bamboo like a distant lawn is gold at dusk and flushed at dawn, where rhododendron forests crown the hills and wander halfway down in scarlet blossom, where each year a dozen shy black bears appear, where a cold river filmed with ice sustains a minor paradise an elephant and tragopan discussed their fellow creature, man. The tragopan last week had heard a rumour from another bird, most probably a quail or sparrow, such birds have gossip in their marrow, that man had hatched a crazy scheme to mar their land and damn their stream, to flood the earth on which they stood and cut the woods down for their wood. Mm -hmm. The tragopan good-natured pheasant, a trifle shocked by this unpleasant, even if quite unlikely news, had scurried off to test the views of his urbane and patient friend, the elephant, who in the end had swung his trunk from side to side with gravitas and thus replied, uh, Who told you? Ah, oh, the quail? Oh, well, I rather doubt it, but who can tell? I would suggest we wait and see. Now, would you like to have some tea? He drew a lukewarm gallon up his trunk and poured his friend a cup. A week passed, and the tragopan one morning read the news and ran in panic down the forest floor to meet the elephant once more. A cub reporter, Bison Calf, who wrote for Bingle Telegraph, had just confirmed the frightful fact in language chilling and exact. Here, read it, said the Chagoban. And so the elephant began. Bingo, 5th April, Saturday. Reliable informants say that the great big shot number one, Sri Padma Bhushan Gobardhan, and the man council of this state, 
Intending to alleviate the water shortage in the town across our region 10 miles down, have spent three cartloads of rupees so far upon consultants' fees whose task is swiftly to appraise efficient, cheap and speedy ways to dam our stream, create a lake and blast a tunnel through to take sufficient water to supply the houses that men occupy. What do you think? The Chagopad burst out. About this wicked plan to turn our valley blue and brown? I will not take this line down. I will cluck at them. I'll flap my wings. I tell you I will do such things. What they are yet I do not know, but... Take my word, I mean to show those odious humans what I feel. And the great partridge will reveal. The, that partridge dwelling in the sky who looks down on us from on high, he will reveal to us the way. So kneel with me and let us pray. Uh, the elephant said, let me think. Before we pray, uh, let's have a drink. No, no. Some bamboo wine, perhaps some tea. No, no, the bird said angrily. I will not give in to distraction. This isn't time for tea, but action. Mm -hmm. The wattled horns upon his head stood upright in an angry red. The elephant said nothing. He surveyed the landscape thoughtfully and flapped his ears like a big fan to cool the angry tragopan. It's infamous, I know, he said, but we have got to use our head. Praying may help us, who can tell, but uh, uh, they, of course, have gods as well. Hmm. I would endeavor uh, uh, to maintain our plans on a terrestrial plane. What I suggest is we convoke the beastly board of forest folk for a full meeting to discuss the worst that can uh, occur to us. So that evening, all the creatures with tusks or gills or other features met at the river's edge to plan how they might outmaneuver man. Gibbons and squirrels, snakes, wild dogs. Deer and macaques, three types of frogs. Porcupines, eagles, trout, wagtails. Civet cats, sparrows, bears and quails. Blood-sucking leeches, mild-eyed newts and leopards in, in their, their spotted, spotted suits. suits. Stated, Stated their stances, asked their questions and made their manifold suggestions. Some predators drooled at the sight, but did not act on appetite. The leopards did not kill the deer. The smaller birds evinced no fear. Each eagle claw sat in its glove. The mood was truce, if not quite love. At meetings of the beastly board, eating each other was outlawed. The arguments grew sharp and heated, some views advanced and some retreated. Some feared to starve and some to drown. Some said they should attack the town. The trout said they were unconcerned if the whole bamboo forest burned, so long as they had space to swim. The miners joked, the boars looked grim. They talked for hours and at the close, at last, the elephant arose and, with a modest trumpet call, drew the attention of all, them all. Oh, beasts of Bengal gathered round. Though in our search for common ground, I would not dream of unanimity, I hope our views may reach proximity. I speak to you as one whose clan has served and therefore studied man. He is a creature mild and vicious, practical-minded and capricious, loving and brutal, sane and mad, the good as puzzling as the bad. The sticky center of this mess is an uneasy selfishness. He rips our flesh and tears our skin for cloth without, for food within, the leopard spots are his to wear, our ivory unknots his hair. 
The trap pan falls to his gun. He shoots the flying fox for fun. The black bear dances to his whim. My own tame cousins slave for him. Yet we who give him work and food have never known his gratitude. He grasps our substance as of right to quench his own appetite. Nor will he grant us truce or grace to rest secure in any place. But Sometimes he worships us as gods <laughs> and sings of us at iced fods or fashions fables, myths and glories to celebrate our deeds and stories. And yet, despite this fertile fuss, when has he truly cared for us? He sees the planet as his fief. Where every hair or drop or leaf or seed or blade or grain of sand is destined for his mouth and hand. If he is thirsty, we must thirst, for of all creatures, man comes first. If he needs room, then we must fly, and if he hungers, we must die. Think what will happen when his scheme to Tame our valley and our stream begins to thrust its way across these gentle slopes of fern and moss with axe, explosive and machine. Since rhododendron logs burn green, they'll all be chopped for firewood or logged and smuggled out for good. As every bird and mammal knows, when, when the road comes, the forest goes. And let me say this to the trout. The bamboo will be slashed, no doubt, and what the tragopan and I delight to eat will burn and die. But what will happen to your stream? Before the reservoir, your dream of endless space can come about, the soot and filth will snuff you out. What? Tolls for us is your own bell. And similarly, let me tell the leopards, who may fancy here a forest full of fleeing deer, after your happy passing slaughter, you too will have to run from water. You will be homeless like us all. It is this fate we must forestall. So let me say to every single endangered citizen of Bingle, we must unite in fur and feather, for we will live or die together. together. All this made such enormous sense that all except the rather dense grey peacock pheasants burst out jeering. The peacock pheasants, after hearing the riotous applause die down, asked with an idiotic frown, but what is it we plan to do? What is it we plan to a do? A bison calf remark. I knew these b b b b b peacock pheasants were, were, were half-witted. And everybody joshed and twitted the silly birds till they were dumb. How typical. How troublesome. A monkey said, what awful taste. How graceless and how brazen-faced. When all of us are clapping paws to undermine our joint, joint applause. applause. Oddly, the elephant was the beast who of them all was put out least. He flapped his ears and bowed his head. The pheasants have a point, he said. Unfortunately, he went on, the days of beastly strength are gone. That's, we, we don't have mankind on the run. That's why he's done what he has done. We can't, as someone here suggested, burn down the town. We'd be arrested, or maimed, or shot, or even eaten. But I will not accept we are beaten. Someone suggested that we flee and set up our community in some far valley where a man has never trod or ever can. <laughs> Sweet to the mind, though this may seem, this is, alas, an idle dream. For nowhere lies beyond man's reach to mar and burn and flood and leech. 
A distant valley is indeed no sanctuary from his greed. Besides, the beasts already there will fight with us for food and air. No, we must struggle for this land where we have stood and where, where we, we stand. What I suggest is we go to the great big shot down below and show him how self-interest and what his conscience says is best. Both tell him, let the valley be. Who knows? Perhaps he may agree, if nothing else, at least to hear us out. But, but we must take, without a doubt, firm data to support our prayer. Um, and in addition, must prepare some other scheme by which he can ensure more water gets to man. For by the twitching of my trunk without that, we will be truly sunk. And so, it happened that a rally meandered forth from Bingal Valley a few days later, up and down the hills towards the human truck town. With trumpet, cackle, grunt and hoot, they harmonized along their route and Long, Long live Bangladesh was heard from snout of beast and beak of bird. Protect our spots, the leopards growled. While the wild dogs and gibbons howled, we dress our sad and sorry tale, the tragedy of Bingal Bell. And there, red breasted in the van, cluck cluck the gallant tragopan, raised high upon the elephant's neck and guiding him by prod and peck. The only absentees, the trout, were much relieved to slither out. And they asked, how can we wet our gills clambering up and down those hills? The journey will be far too taxing. We'd rather spend the time relaxing. We'll, we'll guide, guide, uh, guard the valley while you plead. All right, the other beasts agreed. Meanwhile, from fields and gates and doors, the villagers came out in scores to see the cavalcade go by. Some held their children shoulder high while others clutched at bow or gun and dreamed of pork or venison, but none had seen or even heard of such a horde of beast and bird, and not a bullet or an arrow touched the least feather of a sparrow. So stunned and stupefied were they, they even cheered them on the way, or joined them on the way to town, where the great big shot with a frown said to his ministers, Mm, look here, what is this thing that is drying there? What is this beastly ragtag army? Have I gone blind or am I barney? Yes, yes, sir, said the number two. Mm. I mean, no, no, sir. What to do? They have not gone through proper channels. The protocol protection panels have no idea who they are, nor does the riffraff registrar. It is possible they don't exist. Well, exist or not, said the big shot, getting pissed. They are there, they are getting near, and you will be number 12, I fear. Unless you find out what the fuss is all about, and tender us advice on what to think and do, and say and think. Now off with you. The number two was almost crying. He rushed off with his shirt tails flying without a cummerbund or hat and flew back in a moment flat. Oh, big shot, sir, thanks to your grace, for which I am here in second place. Thanks to your wisdom and your power, which grows in glory by the hour. Thanks to the face you've placed in me, which gives me strength to hear and see. Thanks to the... Yes, Lord. yes, the big shot said. Yes, thanks to my power to cut you dead. What is it you have come to learn? Sir, sir, they plan to overturn your order, sir. To buy a dam of Bingle. And sir, I saw some pressmen mingle with the parade to interview a clouded leopard and a shrew. The beasts are all against your plan. The worst of them is the Dragopan. His eyes are fierce. His breast is red. He wears a wattle on his head. He looks so angry, I have a hunch. He is the leader of the bunch. 
And when I met them, sir, they weren't far. Oh, sir! Oh, no, sir! Here they are! For now, a hula given paw was battering on the big shot's door, and animals from far and wide were crowding in on every side. Say, Bingal Wale! Who's the cry? For Bingal, let us do and lie! Say, Bingal Wale! Wait! 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 Screamed the big shot in a dizzy. Wait! You can't come in! I'm busy! I'm the great big sat, number one, Sri Padma Bhusan Govardhan. I rule by popular anointment. You have to meet me by appointment. What nonsense! cried the dead Jagopan. You try to stop us if you can. The big shot sensed their resolution and turned from awe to elocution. Dear friends, he said, regretfully the matter isn't up to me. What the main council has decreed is not for me to supersede. It is true I, so to speak, presided, but all and none of us decided. That is the doctrine, don't you see, of, of joint responsibility. But if um, next year, in early fall, you fill in all the farms that deal with such a case and bring them over to my place together with the filing fees and three translations in Chinese, uh, the council may at my instigation give them due consideration. Meanwhile, my friend, since you are here a little early in the year, and no fault of yours, of course, but still it's not the best of times, I will invite you to a mighty feast where every bird and every beast will sup on simply superfood. And later, if you are in the mood, please come to hear the speech I am due to give this evening at the zoo. At this pathetic, tactless bribe, a sound rose from the beastly tribe so threatening that the big shot trembled and said to all who were assembled, oh, my, 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 my dear comrades, bear with me. You are upset, as I can see. I meant the stadium, not the zoo. He gestured to his number two, who scrawled a memo in his diary. Perhaps an innocent inquiry, the elephant said, may clear the air. Please tell us all. When you spoke, Sir Big Shot, when you spoke just now, that even if we did somehow fill out your forms and pay your fees, your cure would post-date our disease. Before next fall, our valley would have disappeared, for ill or good. The remedy that you suggest, it might be thought, is not the best. A crafty look appeared upon the Big Shot's face and then was gone. Uh, of course, my friend, it has slipped my mind. But then these days, I often find I had so many piles to read, so many seminars to lead, so many meetings to attend, so many uh, talks that in the end a minor fact or two slips by. But elephant, both you and I appear to understand the world. And here, the big shot's fingers curled around a little golden ring. This vast, unwieldy gathering, dear elephant, is not the place where we can reason face to face about what can or should be done. We should discuss this one on one. To be quite frank, your deputation has not filled me with fondy lesson. Tell them to leave. I'll close the door and we'll continue as before. Although the other beasts agreed, the elephant declared, I'll need my secretary and my hout to help me sort this matter out. Like all the rest, he's left the room, but he can come back, I presume. There's two of you and one of me, so I expect that you'll agree. A big shot nodded. Call the man. Quick as a quack, the tragopan opened the door and strutted in to greet his buddy with a grin. The big shot and his number two scowled as they murmured, How do you do? Tea came. The big shot looked benign. Milk? Thanks. And sugar? What is fine? Uh, it's not too strong. I like mine weak. At last, the moment came to speak. <coughs> you see, good beasts, the big shot said. We need your water or we are dead. It's for the people that I act. Now, the town must drink and that's a fact. Believe me, all your agitation will only lead to worse frustration. Go back, dear beast, to Bengal now. 
we'll re relocate you out. Somehow, in quarters of a certain size, he yawned, rolled his little eyes. Immediately, the Chagopan pulled out his papers and began with fact and query and suggestion to give the big shot indigestion. You say the town is short of water. Yet, at the wedding of your daughter, the whole municipal supply was poured upon your lawns. Well, why? And why is it that Minister's Hill and Babu's Barrow drink that fill through every season dry or wet when all the common people get is water on alternate days? At least that's what my data says and every figure has been checked. So, big shot, wouldn't you expect a radical redistribution would help provide a just solution? The big shot's placid face grew red. He turned to number two and said in her low voice, This agitator is dangerous. Deal with him later. Then turning to the elephant, he murmured sweetly, I'll be blunt, your friend's suggestion is quite charming, but his naivety is alarming. Redistributed night and day, redistributed all away, rasan eat, drop, and you will still find. Demand will leave supply behind. The elephant first sipped his tea and then ate a biscuit leisurely. He shook his head from side to side and having cleared his trunk replied, well, even as regards supply, I do not see the reason why you do not use what lies to hand before you try to dam our land. Even my short walk through this town shows me how everything's run down during your long administration. Your pipes cry out for renovation, your storage tanks corrode and leak, the valves are loose, the washers weak. I've seen the water gushing out from every reservoir and spout. Repair them. It will cost far less than driving us to homelessness by blasting tunnels through our hills and bloating your construction bills. But that's just one of many things. Plant trees, revive your wells and springs, guide from your roofs the monsoon rain into great tanks to use again, reduce your runoff and your waste rather than with unholy haste destroying beauty which once gone the world will never look upon the elephant now overcome with deep emotion brushed a crumb of chocolate biscuit off his brow dear chap <laughs> the big shot said <laughs> dear chap <clears throat> i think you failed to comprehend what really matters in the end the operative word is votes, and next to that is rupee notes. Your plans do not appeal to me because, dear chap, I failed to see how they would help me gather either. He giggled, then continued, neither the charming checks that generous firms with whom the council comes to terms who wish to log or dam or clear or build will come to me, I fear, nor votes. From those who think my schemes will satisfy their thirsty dreams, it is not just water that must funnel out of the hills from Bingle Tunnel. Do animals have funds or votes? Or anything but vocal throats? Will you help me get re-elected? <laughs> you are speechless, just as I suspected. I have tried to talk things out with you, now I will tell you what to do. Lift up your stupid trunk and sign the waiver on the dotted line. Give up all rights in Bengal Vale for fur or feather or tusk or tail. <clears throat> Sadly, since you are now in the know, I can't afford to let you go. Your friend will never leave this room. The Tragopan has found his tomb. As for yourself, my number two will soon escort you to the Jew. <laughs> From this, the other beasts will learn your lands are ours to slash and burn, and any one defying man will be a second Tragopan. He giggled with delight and padded his cheeks with air, then gently added, But if 
You go cahoots with me, I'll spare your friend and let you free. He stroked his ring, and I'll make sure that you'll be, let's say, provided for. Before you could say pheasants too, the servile hands of number two grasped the bird's collar in a vice. The elephant went cold as ice to see his friend cry out in terror. He would have signed the form in error had not the chagopan cried out, Go! Go! Ah, don't sign! And at his shout, the big shot's son came running in and struck the henchman on the chin. And the foiled killer squealed and glared. For a long time, the small fry stared with indignation at his father. Papa, he said, I would much rather give up my place as number three than countenance such treachery. Why can't we let the valley live? Those who succeed us won't forgive the rape of Bingle. I recall the small fry side. When I was small, you used to take me walking there with Mama in the open air. For me, a dusty city boy, it was a dream of peace and joy. Along safe paths we'd walk, a deer might unexpectedly appear among the bamboos and the moss and raise its velvet ears and toss its startled head and bound away. Once I heard, I saw leopard cubs at play and heard the mother's warning cough before you quickly marched me off. Until this day, there is not a single house or hut or field in Bingle. How many such worlds like this remain to free our hearts from noise and pain? And is this fragile vision, lovely fragile vision, to be destroyed by your decision? And do you now propose to make a tunnel, dam, and pleasure lake, with caravans and motorboats and tourists at each other's throats, loudspeakers, shops, high tension wires, and ferris wheels and forest fires? As the roads come, the trees will go. Do villagers round Bingle know what's going to happen to their lands? Or are they too eating from your hands? Had gone snorkeling on the day the council met and signed away the Bingle bills. I know you signed, but why can you not change your mind? You talk of sacrifice and glory. Your actions tell a different story. How do you expect me to respect you or decent folk not to detect you? Where you have crept, must mankind crawl, feared, hated and despised by all? Don't sign, dear elephant. Don't sign. Don't tow my wretched father's line. Dear Tragopan, do not despair. Don't yield the struggle in mid-air. I'll help your cause. And as for you, he turned towards the number two. This time your chin, next time your head. Rubbing his fists, the small fry said. The number two lay on the ground. A snivelling, groveling, snarling sound oozed from his throat. The big shot stood as rigid as a block of wood. He tried to speak, no words came out. Then, with an eerie, strangled shout, he uttered, you malignant but Is this the way I have brought you up? Where did you learn your billabbery blabbering, your jelly-livered jungle jabbering? Your educations made you weak. No good, nettering nature freak who's snorkeled half his life away. Who asked you to go off that day? You've been brought up in privilege? With Coca-Cola in your fridge and lychees in and out of season, how dare you now descend to treason? Only all this would have been yours. These antlers, these heads of boars, this office, these silver plates, these luminous glass paperweights, my voting bank, my number game, my piles, my fortune and my fame. I had a dream, my only son would follow me as number one. I had been grooming you to be a bigger big sat after me. You might have been a higher hero and region to be number zero. But now get out, you are in disgrace. He said, 
and struck the small fry's face. The small fry, bleeding from the nose, fell, and the number two arose and slobbering over the big shot's hand, called in the saviour of the land. At this the elephant got mad, and putting down the pen he had clasped in his trunk to sign instead, poured the whole teapot on their head. The water in a boiling arc splashed down on the double mark. The big shot and his henchmen howled. The tragopan got gocked and scowled. You wanted water, here's your share. Then guards came in from everywhere. And animals came in as well. All, All was confusion, confusion and pell -mell. Mell. All was confusion and pell -mell. Pell -mell. All was confusion and pell -mell. Pell -mell. While, While news reporters, reporters clicked, clicked and word, clicked, clicked and word, clicked and word at limb of man and wing of bird, bird, wing of bird, bird wing of bird, bird, the elephant stood very still. The tragopan rushed around until, provoked by a pernicious speck, the big shot wrung its little neck. The tragopan collapsed and cried, Go! Go! and rolled his eyes and died. He died before he comprehended his transient span on earth had ended. Nor could he raise a plaintive cry to the great partridge in the sky, whose head is wrapped in golden gauze to take his spirit in his claws. What happened happened very fast. The melee was put down at last. The small fry cried out when he saw, found the pheasant stretched out on the ground. The big shot too began repenting when he saw everyone lamenting the martyr's selfless sacrifice. He had the body laid on ice draped in the state flag and arrayed with chevrons, cutchen and cockade. And all the townsfolk came to scan the features of the travel pan. For buglers played abide with me, for matrons wept on a settee, for brigadiers with visage grim threw cornflakes and puffed rice on him. Four schoolgirls robbed the tragopan of feathers for a talisman, and every one stood round and kept long vigil while the hero slept. A long, alas, a final sleep. O oh, oh, elephant, elephant, long may you weep. O oh, oh, elephant, elephant, long may you mourn. This, this is, is a night, night that knows no dawn. Ah, oh, every bingle eye is blurred with sorrow for its hero bird, and every bingle heart in grief turns to its fellow for relief. Alas, for bingle! Who will lead the struggle in its hour of need? Is it the grief-bowed elephant who must now bear the beastly brunt? Oh, will the gallant martyr bird in death if not in life, be heard? Dare the egregious big shot mock the cry, save Bingle, gok, gok, gok? And can a ghostly tragopan help to attain a Bingle ban? For it undoubtedly was true that suddenly the whole state knew of Bingle Valley and the trek that ended in the final peck, the fatal peck. And panegyrics to the pheasant in prose and verse were omnipresent. Suggestions for a cenotaph appeared in Bingle Telegraph and uh, several human papers to discuss the matter through and through. The water problem in the state became a topic for debate. The big shot, struggling with the flood, was splashed with editorial mud. Then intellectuals began to analyze the tragopan. Was he a hothead or a martyr? Um, a, a compromiser or a tartar? Mm, a balanced and strategic planner. Yeah, an, an unthinking project planner. No, no I would say a balanced and un, an unthinking project. It seemed nobody could agree. And maybe that was just as well, for mystery matched with eccentricity provides the great grist for great, great publicity. publicity. And myths of Flexible, flexible dimension, are apt to call forth less dissension. This is a tale without a moral. I hope the reader will not quarrel about this minor missing link, but if he likes them, he can think of five or seven that will do as quasi-morals. Here are two. The first is that you never know just when your luck may break, so 
You may as well work for your cause, even without overt applause. You might, might in time, time achieve, achieve your ends. ends. And the second is that you will find friends in the most unexpected places, hidden among unfriendly faces, for small fry swim in every pond, even the doldrums of despond. And so I'll end the story here. What is to come is still unclear. Whether the fates will smile or frown. And Bingle Vale survive or drown. I do not know and cannot say. Indeed, Indeed perhaps, perhaps I, I never, never may. may. I hope, of course, the beasts we've met will save their hidden valley. Yet, Yet the resolution of their plight, plight is, is for, for the, the world, world not, not me, me to write. write. Thank you, Vikram Seth, for writing this. And for giving us hope. There are small fry among us. Everywhere. In every, In every, every pond. pond <laughs> every place where you lose heart, you find some young person coming up and giving you hope and showing you the way. God bless all of you. And thank you all for listening. Thank you. See you again. <laughs>